I mean, we, okay. we made the call going back to um, September 17th to get out of the loan buy as a function of our medium term views on the economy and how policymakers are going to uh, perpetuate that with you know incrementally dovish policy. You know, yeah. Right now, the Fed is cutting interest rates into a late cycle expansion that does not need policy support. And so what it's likely to do is cause both growth uh, to growth to continue surprising to the upside, which is are currently already baked into our forecast. And it's likely to cause inflation to start to grind higher over the medium term. So in our opinion, that's very negative. That's a, that, a higher than expected nominal GDP environment, which is what we've uh, we're, what we're calling for on a, on a next 12 month forecast horizon basis, that in our opinion is very unlikely to be supportive for bonds. However, it is likely to be supportive for stocks and other risk assets, particularly in the backdrop of U.S. and global liquidity uh, accelerating uh, well, markedly in the first quarter of next year. Darius Dale refers to the decision in September to exit long term bond investments based on their medium term economic outlook and policy expectations. Federal Reserve's current rate cuts are unnecessary in a late cycle economic expansion likely leading to rising inflation. This environment, characterized by higher than expected nominal GDP, is unfavorable for bonds but positive for stocks and risk assets, especially as both U.S. and global liquidity are expected to accelerate in the coming year. Additionally, they expect the Fed funds rate to decrease, with ongoing trade tensions with China potentially intensifying. The speaker, Darius Dale, is known for his in-depth analysis of global economic trends, monetary policy, and market dynamics, often focusing on liquidity, inflation, and risk assets. Argues that tariffs act as a regressive tax on consumer spending and can cause a one-time shock to inflation, as seen in 2018. However, they do not believe tariffs are inherently inflationary. Instead, they see populism as the main driver of future inflation, arising from the broken social contract in the U.S. and the discontent among middle- and lower-income households. This discontent has fueled the rise of populist policies on both sides of the political spectrum. The speaker, Darius Dale, points out that the shift in income distribution has been a significant factor. Over the past 20 to 25 years, corporate profits have grown as a share of national income, while employee compensation has declined. This shift was driven by globalization, NAFTA, China joining the WTO, and repeated quantitative easing, QE, which disproportionately benefited the wealthy. As a result, middle- and lower-income Americans feel left behind, leading to increased support for populist policies, which are expected to continue shaping fiscal policy moving forward. We will present clips from Dale's interview, but before we do, if you want more videos like this, please hit the subscribe button and turn on the notification bell for more updates. Thank you, and enjoy the video. Aggressive tax on consumer spending. So it's very likely to be durably inflationary. You could have a one off change in the price level that creates a one off shock in inflation. And I do believe we saw that in uh, 2018 uh, relative to the trend of inflation that we observe in the post uh, post crisis era, post GFC era. We did have a significant increase in inflation to right around three percent on a core basis in 2018. That was a big change from what we had experienced for the prior you know five to seven years. So that, that was a meaningful uh, shift. However, it wasn't necessarily inflationary in the way that, you know, UI or consumers across America are currently sort of, um, you know, characterizing that uh, today. So, you know, we, we don't believe that tariff policy in and of itself is inflationary. What we see the biggest upside risk to inflation uh, stemming out of the, either the Trump or Kamala Harris administrations, because we have a relatively, you know, sort of similar view on the outlook for fiscal policy in either administration, where we see the inflation, uh, the, 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 the next round of inflation to come from is populism. And we continue to see populism uh, brew up on both sides of the aisle, mostly as a function of the broken down social contract that we have here in America. Um, you know, I'll show a chart uh, from our most recent uh, macro scouting report. Every month we publish this a report for our uh, clients here, 42 Macro, uh, where we try to help them, you know, kind of hone in on all the, you know, kind of big growth, inflation policy, and and, and, and liquidity uh, the drivers of asset markets. And so provide them with a very sanguine, clear view of how those things are likely to um, to unfold. And when you look at this chart here, we show employee compensation divided by uh, nominal gross domestic income, uh, that's declined about 56%. We see corporate profits uh, as a share of uh, gross domestic income that is accelerated to 13%. If you go back and you look at the, the long-term means of these time series, the respective means of these time series, they were 63% and 9% respectively. So we've had a, essentially a 400 basis point shift uh, away from employee compensation into the, 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 the corporate, corporate profits. Now that doesn't sound like a lot, but it's a significant deal as it relates to what drove that uh, shift. 
We've seen a hollowing out of the U.S. manufacturing sector over the past 20 to 30, 20 to 25 years. And as a function of that, we've seen a greater and greater share of corporate profits go to or a greater and greater share of national income go to corporate profits. And part of this, in our opinion, was globalization. Obviously, we had the NAFTA agreement in the late 90s. We had China join the WTO in 2001. And as a function of those policies and, and other policies, um, you, know, we, you know, not the least of which is QE, incessant uh, QE, um, you know, sort of siphoning, uh, you know, creating a, a stimulus for the incomes of the folks in the upper income of the distribution. We've had a, a series of policies in this economy that have really kind of put the middle to lower, quote unquote, class on its back, you know, middle to low income household consumers on their back. And as a function of that, they're pissed off, you know, for lack of a better word, David, they're upset, they're frustrated, and they're looking for solutions. That's what this is why Donald Trump is a politician. This is why we've gotten a, it's a sequence of populist uh, monetary and fiscal policy since 2008. And we are like, what is to a, continue to what is a, a sequence of that populist fiscal policy going forward? Darius Dale believes that excessive fiscal support, monetary debasement and currency devaluation will continue, making them bullish on risk assets like stocks, credit, crypto and commodities while being bearish on defensive assets like treasury bonds and the U.S. dollar. They anticipate increased money supply growth, boosting liquidity, and supporting bull markets in risk assets. Darius Dale, in a crosstalk with David Lynn, highlights a shift in the treasury market. Private sector investors now hold a larger share, 54%, as foreign central banks and commercial banks reduce their participation. This means private investors will demand higher yields to invest in treasuries. To counter this, the Federal Reserve will likely resort to more financial repression and monetary easing, further debasing the currency, while banks increase their holdings of treasuries. These dynamics are seen as highly favorable for risk assets. Darius Dale emphasizes that market movements are less about geopolitical conflicts, such as the ongoing Israel-Iran tensions, and more about how policymakers respond. Despite these conflicts, markets like stocks, Bitcoin, and gold have surged. The key factor for asset markets is how these events impact liquidity, ultimately driving market behavior. Let's dive into the interview. And what we typically see from the Federal Reserve uh, is monetary debasement and financial repression. And so it's our belief that as a function of those three things, excessive fiscal policy, support of the economy, monetary debasement to capitalize that fiscal support and uh, and, and, and currency um, devaluation uh, to, to capitalize that fiscal support as well. If you put those three things together, you should be just like we've been for a long time here for E2 Macro, structurally bullish on risk assets like stocks, credit, crypto commodities, and structurally bearish on defensive assets like treasury bonds and US dollar. Doesn't necessarily mean the treasury bonds or and or the US dollar are going to decline in price. The dollar will likely decline in price as a function of those policies. But doesn't necessarily mean the treasury bonds are going to decline in price because we're getting financial pressure. So, uh, you know, I'll show you a couple of charts uh, from our uh, fourth turning analysis that sort of support that uh, takeaway. Uh, so one of the things that we observed uh, in this uh, the study that money supply growth uh, tends to accelerate uh, sharply uh, during fourth turning. So that's something that we're uh, ex anticipating as investors. If we have a significant uptick in money supply growth, you're talking about a significant uptick in liquidity. And historically, a significant uptick in liquidity have done, you know, that have, you know, perpetuated, you know, raging bull markets and, and risk assets. Uh, the other thing I would highlight is with respect to uh, the financial pressure that we're likely to uh, see. The 12-month real T-bill yield has tended to decline substantially in fourth turnings, which means the Fed has a, uh, a negative uh, a policy rate on an inflation-adjusted basis. You've also seen the same similar dynamics uh, with the 10-year real treasury yield. So there is an evidence of financial repression occurring uh, in this fourth turning, and we have a belief that we're probably going to see even more financial repression in this particular fourth turning than we have historically. If you look at this chart here where we show uh, the, uh, the the private sector, uh, sorry, we, sh we show that we break down the, the, the marketable Treasury securities market into its various large investor cohorts. So you have the Federal Reserve, which is shares declining. It's plus 16% or 16% of the total now. Uh, you have commercial banks, U.S. commercial banks. Uh, their share has been declining uh, since 2021 as well. Uh, they're now 15% of the total. And then if you have foreign central banks, which is a black line, uh, that peaked back in 2008, uh, they, their share continues to decline at 14% of the total. So if these three major cohorts of investors are all sort of divesting at the margins, you know, relative or the very minimum, not keeping up pace uh, with the growth of you know public debts here in this economy, that means the private sector has to pick up the slack. So the private sector was 36% of the marketable treasury market uh, back in late 2021, uh, when we called for bond yields to mat uh, materially accelerate uh, to the upside uh, as a function of the return of the uh, treasury's uh, net financing policy uh, in 2022. Uh, so that's obviously something that, that you know we were accurate and prescient on. But you go look at that 36% 
uh, percent uh, ratio, it's now up at 54 percent. So the private sector investors now, you know, real, real, real money investors now own 54 percent of the marketable treasury market up from 36 uh, percent just a, uh, just a couple of years ago. And, and just the reason that's important, David, is because investors will demand higher yields to capitalize Uncle Sam. We, the private sector, want return for the units of risk that we're taking in our portfolios. We're not just going to you know, buy a, a treasury bond at any price like a foreign central bank would or a commercial bank would based, based on you know, changes in regulation, Basel, you know, Dodd-Frank, et cetera, or the Federal Reserve would if they're implementing a, a large-scale asset purchase program. And so that's, in our view, the Fed has to do something to offset that. And so we're going to see more currency debasement. We're going to see more uh, financial oppression by banks uh, of banks into the treasury market. Currently, banks are uh, 18% of their uh, total assets are in uh, treasury and agency securities. Uh, when you do some ratio math, you know, because we don't have that time series going back as far, you can do some ratio math. It was about 47% of commercial banks, treasury and agency securities back in the prior fourth turning. So we know that number is going up. We know the Fed's balance sheet is going to go up. And we also know that foreign central banks, depending on how this, this geopolitical developments, um, uh, geopolitical developments uh, uh, sort of uh, progress throughout this fourth turning, are probably not going to increase their share. So as a function of all that, then the Fed and, 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 and re regulation that financially represses investors into the treasury market will have to accelerate markedly. And all those things are incredibly bullish for risk assets. You got to focus on the things that actually matter most to markets. And so, David, to your point, the way we would characterize uh, the impact of, a, of an acceleration uh, in the um, conflicts that we're seeing with uh, Israel and, and Iran, but which, by the way, that conflict began a little bit over a year ago. Stock market's up 35 percent. Bitcoin's up like 150 percent. Gold's up like 30 percent. Again, it's not the conflict that matters. It's how policy policymakers respond to the conflict and or not even pay attention to the conflict at all. Um, you know, so in our opinion, how that will ultimately derail asset markets is through the lens of liquidity. The speaker highlights the critical factors shaping markets, including excessive fiscal and monetary policies, populism and financial repression, which favor risk assets like stocks, crypto and commodities. They downplay the direct impact of geopolitical conflicts, instead stressing how liquidity driven policy responses influence market behavior. Ultimately, the speaker foresees continued currency debasement and a shift in treasury markets, with private investors demanding higher yields, as key trends in the near term. How does the speaker view the role of populism in driving future inflation? Let us know in the comments section below. Also, ensure you like this video, subscribe to the channel, and turn on post notifications for more videos like this. Until next time.